Volume three, chapter eighteen of A Charming Fellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume three, chapter eighteen. Algernon's state of mind during his return journey to Whitford was very much pleasanter than it had been on his way up to town. To be sure, he had committed himself distinctly to a very grave statement. That was always disagreeable, but then he had made an immense impression on Lord Seely by his statement. He had crushed and overwhelmed that pompous little ass. He had humiliated that absurd little upstart, and best of all, for these others were mere dilettante pleasures, which no man of intelligence would indulge in at the cost of his solid interests. He had terrified him so completely with the spectre of a public scandal and disgrace that my lord was ready to do anything to help him and Castalia out of England. Of that there could be no doubt. It must be owned that Algernon had so far justified the quick suspicions of his Whitford creditors and acquaintances, as to have conceived for a moment the idea of never more returning to that uninteresting town. It was extremely exhilarating to be in the position of a bachelor at large, to find himself free for a time of the dead weight of debt, which seemed to make breathing difficult in Whitford, for although by plodding characters the relief might not have been felt until the debts were paid, Algernon Errington's spirit was of a sort that rose buoyant as ever, directly the external pressure was removed. It was delightful to be reinstated in the enjoyment of his reputation as a charming fellow, much fallen into oblivion at Whitford, and perhaps it was pleasantest of all to feel strengthened in the assurance that he still was a charming fellow, with capacities for winning admiration and making a brilliant figure quite uninjured, although they had been temporarily eclipsed, by all the cloud of troubles which had gathered around him. So he had, for a moment, thought of fairly running away from wife and duns and dangers of official severities, but it was but a brief unsubstantial vision that flashed for an instant and was gone. Algernon was too clear-sighted not to perceive that the course was inconvenient, nay, to one of his temperament impracticable. People who started off to live on their wits in a foreign country ought to be armed with a coarser indifference to material comforts than he was gifted with. Alternations of ortolans and champagne, with bread and onions, would be, even supposing one could be sure of the ortolans, which Algernon knew he could not, entirely repugnant to his temperament. He had no strain of adventurousness, as would have given a pleasant glow of excitement, to the endurance of privation under any circumstances whatever, professed bohemians might talk as they pleased about kicking over traces and getting rid of trammels and so forth but for his part he had never felt his spirit in the least oppressed by velvet hangings gilded furniture or french cookery whereas to be obliged to wear shabby gloves would have been a kind of trammel he would strongly have objected to in a word he desired to be luxuriously comfortable always and he consistently albeit perhaps mistakenly for the cleverest of us are liable to error endeavoured to be so Therefore he did not ship himself aboard an emigrant vessel for the United States, nor did he even cross the channel to Calais, but found himself in a corner of the mail-coach on the night after Jack Price's supper-party, bowling along, not altogether unpleasantly, towards Whitford. He had not seen Lord Seely again. He had inquired for him at his house, and had been told that his lordship was worse, was confined to bed entirely, and that Dr. Noakes had called in two other physicians in consultation deuce of a job if he dies before i get a berth thought algernon but before he had gone many yards down the street he was in a great measure reassured as to that danger by seeing lady seely in her big yellow coach with fido on the seat beside her and her favourite nephew lounging on the cushions opposite the nephew had been apparently entertaining lady seely by some amusing story for she was laughing rather to the ear than to the eye as was her custom for my lady made a great noise sending out ha ha ha's with a kind of defiant distinctness whilst all the while eyes and mouth plainly professed themselves disdainful of too cordial a hilarity and ready to stop short in a second and stroking fido very unconcernedly with one fat tightly gloved hand now although algernon did not give my lady credit for much depth of sentiment he felt sure that she would for various reasons have been greatly disquieted had any danger threatened her husband's life and would certainly not have left his side to drive in the park with young reginald so he drew the inference that my lord was not so desperately ill as he had been told and that the servants had had orders to give him that account in order to keep him away which was pretty nearly the fact the old woman would be in a fury with me when my lord told her he had promised me that post without consulting her thought algernon and would tell any lie to keep me out of the house but we shall beat her this time 
and as he so thought he pulled off his hat and made so distinguished and condescending a bow to my lady that her nephew who was near-sighted and did not recognize errington pulled off his own hat in a hurry very awkwardly and acknowledged the salute with some confused idea that the graceful gentleman was a foreigner of distinction whilst my lady turning purple shook her head at him in anger at the whole incident all which algernon saw and understood and was immensely diverted by in summing up the results of his journey to town he was satisfied things were certainly not so pleasant as they might be but were they not better on the whole than when he had left whitford he decidedly thought they were which did not of course diminish his sense of being a victim to circumstances and the seely family anyway he had broken with whitford my lord must get him out of that barricade the very thought of leaving the place raised his spirits and as he had the coach to himself during nearly all the journey he was able to stretch his legs and make himself comfortable and he awoke from a sound and refreshing sleep as the mail-coach rattled into the high street and rumbled under the archway of the blue bell the hour was early and the morning was raw and algernon resolved to refresh himself with a hot bath and breakfast before proceeding to ivy lodge no use disturbing mrs addington so early he said to the landlord who appeared just as algernon was sipping his tea before a blazing fire very good devilled kidney mr rumbold he added condescendingly mr rumbold rubbed his hands and stood looking half sulkily half deferentially at his guest his wife had said to him don't you go chatting with that young Arrington, Rumbold, not if you want to get your money. I know what he is, and I know what you are, Rumbold, and he'll talk you over in no time. But Mr. Rumbold had allowed his own valour to override his wife's discretion, and had declared that he would make the young man understand, before he left the Blue Bell, that it was absolutely necessary to settle his account there without delay. And the result justified Mrs. Rumbold's apprehensions, for Algernon and Errington drove away from the inn without having paid even for the breakfast he had eaten there that morning, and having added the vehicle which carried him home to the long list beginning, Flies, A. Errington, Esquire, in which he figured as debtor to the landlord of the Blue Bell. He had flourished Lord Seely in Mr. Rumbold's face with excellent effect, and was feeling quite cheerful when he alighted at the gate of Ivy Lodge it was still early according to castalia's reckoning little more than ten o'clock so he was not surprised at not finding her in the drawing-room or the dining-room lydia of whom he inquired at length as to where her mistress was having first bade her light a fire for him to have a cigar by before going to the office lydia said with a queer half scared half saucy look laws sir missus has been out this hour and a half out yes sir she said as how she couldn't rest in her bed nor yet in the house sir polly made her take a cup of tea and then she went off to whit meadow to whit meadow in this damp raw weather at nine o'clock in the morning please sir me and polly thought it wasn't safe for missus and her so delicate but she would go algernon shrugged his shoulders and said no more before the girl left the room she said oh and please sir here's some letters as came for you pointing to a little heap of papers on castalia's desk Left alone, Algernon drew his chair up to the fire and lit a cigar. He did not hasten himself to examine the letters. Bills, of course. What else could they be? He began to smoke and ruminate. He would have liked to see Castalia before going to the office. He would have liked to make his own representation to her of the story he had told Lord Seely. She must be got to corroborate it unknowingly, if possible. He reflected with some bitterness that she had lately shown so much power of opposing him, that it might be she would insist on taking a course of conduct which would upset all the combination he with the help of chance circumstances had so neatly pieced together and then he reflected further knitting his brows a little that at any cost she must be prevented from spoiling his plans and that her conduct lately had been so strange that it wouldn't be very difficult to convince the world of her insanity gad i'm almost convinced of it to myself said algernon half aloud but it was not true the fire was warm the room was quiet the cigar was good the chair was easy algernon felt tempted to sit still and put off the moment when he must re-enter the whitford post-office he shuddered as he thought of the place with a kind of physical repulsion nevertheless it must be faced once or twice more not much more often he hoped he rose up put on a great coat and said to himself lazily as he ran his fingers through his hair in front of the looking-glass where the devil can castalia have gone mooning to then he turned to leave the room. As he turned, his eyes fell on the little heap of letters. He took them up and turned them over with a grimace. Hm, Ravel, respectful compliments. Ah, oh, no, your mouth ought to have been stopped, I think. But that's the way. More they get, more they want. Never pay an instalment. Fatal precedent. What's this? A lawyer's letter? Gladwish. Oh, very well, Mr. Gladwish. Nouveau chemist. 
"'What on earth? Oh, uh, rose water. Better than his boluses, I dare say, but not very good, and quite humorously, dear. Extortionate rascal! And who are you, my illiterate-looking friend?' He took a square blue envelope between his finger and thumb, and examined the cramped handwriting on it, running in a slanting line from one corner to the other. It was addressed to Mr. Algernon Errington. "'Some very angry creditor, who won't even indulge me with the customary esquire,' thought Algernon, with a contemptuous smile, and some genuine amusement. Then he opened it. It was from Jonathan Maxfield. End of chapter 18volume three chapter nineteen of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume three chapter nineteen in about a quarter of an hour after reading that letter algernon called to the servants to know if their mistress had come back he did not ring as usual but went to the door of the kitchen and spoke to both the women saying that he was uneasy at mrs errington's absence and did not like to go to the office without seeing her he said two or three times how strange it was that his wife should have wandered out in that way and plainly showed considerable anxiety about her both the women remarked how pale and upset their master looked oh it's enough to wear anybody out the way she goes on said lydia poor young man a nice way to welcome him home ah returned polly the cook shaking her head i'm afraid there's going to be awful trouble with missus poor thing i believe she's half out of her mind with jealousy just think how she's been going on about miss maxfield why tis all over the place and they say old max is going to law against her or something but i can't but pity her poor thing oh they say worse of her than being out of her mind with jealousy returned lydia don't you know what mrs revell's housemaid told her young man at the grocer's etc etc the discussion was checked in full career by their master returning to say that he should not go to the office until he had seen mrs errington and that he was then going to whitmeadow to look for her he went out past the kitchen and through the garden at the back of the house he looked about him when he got to the garden gate nothing to be seen but damp green meadow leaden sky and leaden river where was castalia a thought shot into his mind swift and keen as an arrow had she thrown herself into the wit and if she had what a load of his cares would be drowned with her he walked a few paces towards the town then turned and looked in the opposite direction for as far as he could see there was not a human being on the meadow path his eyes were very good and he used them eagerly scanning all the space of whitmeadow within their range of vision at length he caught sight of something moving among a clump of low bushes blackberry bushes and dog roses a tangle of leafless spikes now although in the summer they would be fresh and fragrant and the holiday haunt of little merry children which grew on a sloping part of the bank between him and the wit he walked straight towards it and as he drew nearer became satisfied that the moving figure was that of his wife he recognized a dark tartan shawl which she wore it was not bright enough to be visible at a long distance but as he advanced he became sure that he knew it in a few minutes the husband and wife stood face to face. "'This is a nice reception to give me,' said Algernon, in a hard, cold voice, after they had looked at each other for a second, and Castalia had remained silent and still. In truth, she was physically unable to speak to him in that first moment of meeting. Her heart throbbed so that every beat of it seemed like an angry blow threatening her life. "'Why do you wander out alone in this way? Why do you conduct yourself like a madwoman?' though indeed perhaps you are not so wrong there madness might excuse your conduct nothing else can i couldn't stay in that house i should have died there everything in every room reminded me of you she answered so faintly that he had to strain his ear to hear her and her colourless lips trembled as the lips tremble of a person trying to keep back tears but her eyes were quite dry algernon was pale with the peculiar ghastly pallor of a fresh ruddy complexion his blue eyes had a glitter in them like ice, not fire, and there was a set, sarcastic, bitter smile on his mouth. "'Look here, Castalia, we had better understand one another at once. I shall begin by telling you what I have resolved upon, and what I have done, and you will then have to obey me implicitly. There must be no sort of discussion or hesitation. Come back to the house with me at once.' She shook her head quickly. "'No, no, tell me here, out here by ourselves, where no one can hear us.' I cannot bear to go into that house yet. Cha! What intolerable fooling! Well, here be it. I have no time to waste. I have seen your uncle. Don't interrupt me. 
he has promised to get us out of this cursed place and to find a post for me abroad as consul i had to exercise a good deal of persistence and ability to bring him to that point but to that point i have brought him we must keep him to it and be active my lady will move heaven and earth or t'other place and earth which is more in her line to thwart us now when it is necessary to keep things here as smooth as possible to arouse no suspicion that we may be offered a moment's notice to hold out hopes of everything being settled by lord seely's help what do i find i find that you have gone to a man who is a creditor of mine who is not over fond of me to begin with and have grossly and outrageously insulted him and his daughter just as if you had ingeniously cast about for the most effectual means of doing me a mischief i found this letter on the table he threatens to ruin me and he can do it if my name is posted my bills protested and a public hullabaloo made about them and other matters your uncle's influence will hardly suffice to get me the berth i want in the face of the opposition newspapers bellowing on the subject your uncle is but small beer in london at best but that much but that much he might have managed if you hadn't behaved in this maniacal way and how have you behaved oh ancram ancram i would not have believed i could not she burst into tears and sank down on the damp grass covering her face with her hands and shaking with sobs listen castalia do you hear me said her husband shaking her lightly by the arm she did not answer but continued to cry convulsively rocking herself to and fro algernon stood looking down upon her with folded arms upon my soul he said after a minute and with a contemptuous little nod of the head which expressed an unbounded sense of the hopeless imbecility of the woman at his feet and of his own long-suffering tolerance towards her upon my life and soul castalia i have never even heard of any one so outrageously unreasonable as you are your jealousy we may as well speak plainly your jealousy has passed the bounds of sanity but as i told you i am not going to argue with you i am going to give directions for your guidance since it is quite clear you are unable to guide yourself in the first place for god's sake stop that noise he cried a sudden fierce irritation piercing through his self-restraint in the first place you must make a full free and humble apology to rhoda maxfield castalia started to her feet and confronted him never she said i will never do it i told you i was not going to argue with you i am giving you your orders a full free and humble very humble apology to rhoda maxfield is our one chance of softening her father and if you have any sense or conscience left you must know that rhoda richly deserves every apology you can make her do you think so do you yes i think so she is a thoroughly good and charming girl the only crime she has ever committed against you is being young and pretty and if you quarrel with every woman who is so you will find the battle a rather unequal one he could not resist the sneer he detested castalia at that moment her whole nature her violence her passionate jealousy her no less passionate love her piteous grief her demands on some sentiment in himself which he knew to be non-existent every turn of her body every tone of her voice were at that moment intensely repulsive to him the poor thing was stung into such pain by his taunt that she scarcely knew what she said or what she did oh i know she cried that you care more for her than for me a pink and white face that's all you value more than wife or or anything in the world more than the honour of a gentleman she's a devil a sly sleek little devil she has got your love away from me she has made you tell lies and be cruel to me but i'll expose her to all the world what in the name of all that's incomprehensible has put this craze into your head against rhoda maxfield it's the wildest thing oh ancram you can't deceive me any longer i know i have seen she came on the sly to see you at the office you used to go to her when you told me you had to be busy at the office i watched you i followed you all down whitford high street one night and found out that you were cheating me ha and you also opened my desk at the office and took out letters and papers do you know what people are called who do such things said algernon now in a white heat of anger she drew back and looked at him yes she said i know have you no shame then no common sense you attack a young lady yes a lady a far better lady than you are of whom you take it into your head to be jealous merely because she is pretty and admired by everybody by me amongst the everybodies why not i didn't lose my eyesight when i married you you talk about my not loving you do you think you go the way to make me do anything but detest the sight of you 
you disgrace me in town you disgrace me before my clerk in the office you and your relations persecuted me into marrying you and now you haven't even the decency to behave like a rational being but make yourself a laughing-stock and me a butt for contemptuous pity in having tied myself to such a woman one would have thought you would try to make some amends for the troubles i have been plunged into by my marriage she put her hands up one to each side of her head and held them there tightly pressed Ancrum, she said do you detest the sight of me you've tried your best to make me have you no spark of kindness or affection for me in your heart not one come castalia let us have done with this i thoroughly dislike and object to scenes of any kind you have a taste for them unfortunately what you have to do now is to do as i bid you and try to make your peace by begging rhoda's pardon and so trying to undo a little of the mischief your insane temper has caused Ancrum, say one kind word to me good god castalia how can you be so exasperatingly childish one word say you love me a little still say you did love me when you married me don't let me believe that i have been a miserable dupe all along she no longer refused point-blank to obey him she was bending into her old attitude of submission to his wishes his ascendancy over her was paramount still but she had made herself thoroughly obnoxious to him and must be punished algernon's resentments were neither quick nor numerous but they were lasting his distaste for certain temperaments was profound castalia's intensity of emotion and her ungoverned way of showing it roused a sense of antagonism in him which came nearer to passion than anything he had ever felt with the sure instinct of cruelty he confronted her wild eager supplicating face with a hard cold sarcastic smile and a slight shrug a blow from his hand would have been tender by comparison then he pulled out his watch and said how long do you intend this performance to last in the quietest voice in the world and all the while he was in a white heat of anger as i have said oh ancrum oh ancrum she cried then with a sudden change of tone she said will you promise me one thing will you swear never to see rhoda maxfield again if you will do that i will i will try to forgive you to forgive me then you really have lost your senses no i wish i had i would rather be mad than know what i know but think ancrum think well before you refuse me this one thing is all i ask never see or speak to her or write to her again not even when i am dead swear it i think if you swore it you would keep it wouldn't you this one poor thing for all i have borne for all i am willing to bear i'll take that as proof that you don't love her best i'll be content with that i'll give up everything else in the whole world only do this one thing for me ancrum i beg it on my knees she did indeed fall on her knees as she spoke and stretched out her clasped hands towards him for one second their eyes met then he turned his way and said as quietly as ever i am going to mr and miss maxfield at once with the most effectual apology which could be offered to them namely that you are a maniac and in any case not responsible for your actions nor to be treated like a rational being she staggered up to her feet very well she gasped out then i shall not spare you nor her i have had a letter from my uncle he has told me what you accuse me of i went to the office that man there told me the same the notes that i paid away to revel you wondered you were uneasy why you gave me them yourself oh ancrum how could you have the heart i wish i was dead i wish to god you were she was standing close to the edge of the steep slippery bank and when he said these words she staggered and with a little heartbroken moan put out her hand to clutch at him groping like a blind person he shook off her grasp with a sudden rough movement and the next instant she was deep in the dark ice-cold water end of chapter nineteen volume three chapter twenty of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume three chapter twenty it was past midday when a loud peal at the bell of ivy lodge startled the women in the kitchen polly ran to the front door to open it there stood her master who pushed quickly into the house past her is your mistress come back he asked almost breathlessly no sir oh mercy me what's the matter what has happened she cried for his face showed undisguised terror and agitation he sat down in the dining-room and asked for a glass of wine having drunk it at a gulp he said 
i cannot understand it i have been nearly to whitford along the meadow path i didn't try the other way but then she would not have wandered toward duckwell surely then i crossed the fields and came back by the road looking everywhere and asking every one i met nothing to be seen of her your mistress's manner has been so strange of late you must have noticed it i-i am afraid i cannot help being afraid that some terrible thing has happened to her i have had a dreadful weight and presentiment on my mind all the morning where can she be oh no no sir never fear she'll be all safe somewheres or other she'll just have gone wandering on into the town she have been strange in her ways poor thing and we couldn't but see it sir but she can't have come to no harm there's nothing to hurt her hereabout thus honest polly consolingly but she was infected too by the terror in her master's white face you don't know he said tremulously what reason i have for uneasiness he drew out from his pocket-book a torn scrap of paper with some writing on it i found this on the floor by her desk this morning this is what alarmed me so before i went out but i wouldn't say anything about it then polly stared at the paper with eager curiosity but the sharp slanting writing puzzled her eyes never quite at their ease with the alphabet in any shape is it missus's writing she asked yes see she talks of being so wretched why god knows her mind has been quite unhinged that is the only explanation and you see she says it will not be long before this misery is at an end i cannot live on as i am living i will not lord her mercy upon us ejaculated the woman on whom the full force of her master's anxiety and alarm suddenly broke her round ruddy cheeks grew almost as white as his and lydia who had been peeping and listening at the door burst out crying and began uttering a series of incoherent phrases hold your noise said polly roughly there's troubles enough without you now look ye here sir i'll put on my bonnet and go right down into whitford you take a look along whit meadow up duckwell way i bet ten pounds she's there somewheres about she has taken into going about through the fields hasn't she lydia oh hold your noise and try to do something to help you whimpering fool polly's violent excitement and trepidation took a practical form whilst the other woman was utterly helpless she was bidden to stay at home and receive missus and tell her that master was coming back and beg her to bide still in the house until he should return but i'm afraid she'll never come back sobbed lydia i'm so frightened to stop here by myself oh you great silly haven't you got no feeling for the poor husband he looks scared well nigh to death poor lad and as for you it ain't much you care what's become of missus you never had a good word for her you're only crying because you're a coward meanwhile algernon sat in the little dining-room with a strange sensation as if every muscle in his body had been turned into lead he must get up and go out as the woman had said he must but there he sat with that sensation of marvellous weight holding him down in his chair the house was absolutely still lydia unable to remain alone in the kitchen had gone to stand at the front door and stare up and down the road thus she heard nothing of footsteps approaching the house at the back coming hurriedly through the garden and pausing at the threshold of the door which was open presently after some muttered conversation in which two or three voices took part a man entered the house and came along the passage looking as he went into the kitchen and finding no one just as he reached the door of the dining-room algernon came out and confronted him there's been an accident sir i'm sorry to say said the man the alarm was given up our way about an hour and a half ago somebody's fallen into the wit i'm very sorry sir but i'm afraid you must prepare for bad news whilst he was speaking the house had filled with an ever-gathering crowd people stood in the passage peeping over each other's shoulders and pushing to get a glimpse of algernon there were even faces pressed to the windows outside and the garden was blocked up polly had come hurrying back from the town and now elbowed her way through the crowd to her master she soon cleared the passage of the throng of idlers who blocked it up and shut them outside the door by main force they still swarmed about the house and garden both on the side of the road and on that of whit meadow and their numbers increased every minute polly pulled the man who had been spokesman into the dining-room and bade him say what he had to say without further preamble it's no use preparing him she said pointing to algernon who had sunk into a chair and was holding his forehead with his hands you'll only make it worse i'm afraid you can't tell him anything dreadfuller than he's got into his head already speak out thus requested the man a carpenter of pudcombe village told his tale some men working in the fields about a mile above whitford half a mile perhaps from ivy lodge had heard cries for help from the meadows near the river he the carpenter happened to be passing along a field path from a farmhouse where he had been at work and ran with the labourers down to the water's edge there they saw david powell the methodist preacher wildly shouting for help and with clothes dripping wet 
he had waded waist deep into the wit to try to save some one who was drowning there but in vain he could not swim and the current had carried the drowning person out of his reach you know said the carpenter there are some ugly swirls and currents in the wit for all it looks so sluggish a boat had been got out and manned and had made all speed in the direction powell pointed out he insisted on accompanying them in his wet clothes they searched the river for some time in vain they had got as far as duckwell reach when they caught sight of a dark object close in shore it was the form of a woman her clothes had caught in the broken stump of an old willow that grew half in the water and she was thus held there swinging to and fro with the current she was taken out and carried to duckwell farm where every effort had been made to restore her to consciousness powell understood the best methods to employ the seth maxfields had done everything in their power but it was no use she had never moved nor breathed nor quivered an eyelash that was the substance of the carpenter's story is she dead asked algernon with his face hidden they were the first words he had spoken and when the man answered with a mournful but positive yes quite quite dead he said not a syllable further but turned away from them and buried his head in the cushions of the chair he hasn't even asked who the woman was whispered the carpenter to polly the tears were streaming down the woman's cheeks castalia had not made herself beloved in her own house but polly had felt the sort of regard for her which grows by acts of kindness and forbearance and compassion performed she shook her head and answered in an equally low voice no need for him to ask poor young fellow we've all been fearing something dreadful about missus all morning and he had his reasons for being afraid as she had gone and done something desperate what you don't mean that she made away with herself said the carpenter raising his hands oh that's more than you and i know best say nothing how can we judge poor soul well i always did feel sorry for her and that i'll say though mind you i'm sorry for him too but there's some folks as can't stroke the dog without kicking the cat the news spread rapidly through whitford and caused the utmost excitement there mrs algernon errington had been found drowned in the wit how whether by accident or design no one knew but that did not prevent people from hazarding a thousand conjectures she had wandered out alone had ventured too near the edge of the slippery bank and had lost her footing she had been robbed and thrown into the river she had committed suicide from ungovernable jealousy she had committed suicide in a fit of insanity she had become a hypochondriac she had gone raving mad she had committed various frauds at the post-office and had killed herself in terror at the prospect of their coming to light this latter hypothesis found much credence so many circumstances trifling perhaps in themselves but important when massed together seemed to corroborate it and then if that did not seem an adequate motive for the desperate deed castalia's notorious and passionate jealousy was thrown in as a make-weight there would be a coroner's inquest of course and the chief witness at it would probably be david powell it appeared he was the last person who had seen the unfortunate woman alive mrs thimbleby was in terrible affliction mr powell was very ill he had plunged into the ice-cold river and had then remained for hours in his wet clothes he had not been able to walk back from duckwell farm and farmer maxfield had brought him home himself in his spring cart and had bidden widow thimbleby look after him a little for he maxfield thought the preacher in a very bad way he was seized with violent fits of shivering and the doctor whom mrs thimbleby sent for to see him on her own responsibility told them to get him into bed at once to keep him warm and to administer certain remedies which he ordered but no word would powell speak about his ailments to the doctor or to any one else he waved off all questions with a determined though gentle resolution he allowed himself to be helped into bed being absolutely unable to stand or walk without assistance and he did not refuse the warm clothing which the widow heaped upon him he lay still and passive but he would say no word of his symptoms and sensations to the doctor the man can in no wise help me he said to mrs thimbleby all the wisdom of this world is foolishness to one whom the lord has laid his hands on i am bowed as a reed yes i am broken his voice was hoarse and feeble and his eyes blazed with a feverish light the widow found it vain to importune him to swallow the medicines that had been sent in her heart she had some misgivings that it might be wrong to interfere in the dealings of providence with so holy a man by administering drugs to him but the misgivings never reached a point of conviction that might have comforted her i'll leave you quiet a while mr powell she said maybe you'll sleep and that would do you more good than anything sleep is god's own cure for many troubles isn't it 
he looked at her with a wild unrecognizing stare when i say my bed shall comfort me my couch shall ease my complaint then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions he murmured the good woman softly went away wiping the tears from her eyes one thing is a mercy said the poor soul to herself and that is that mr diamond is so kind and thoughtful he gives no trouble and is a help on the contrary and i'm sure i don't know how we should have managed without his arm to help mr powell upstairs and another thing is a mercy i hope it isn't wrong to feel it so that mrs errington is out of the house i do not know how i should have been strengthened to keep up and attend upon her and she in such a way poor thing the lord has had pity on us for mr powell's sake minnie bodkin had driven to mrs thimbleby's house early in the afternoon and taken mrs errington away with her mrs errington had rushed to ivy lodge under the first shock of the terrible news which mr smith the surgeon communicated to her she had seen her son for a few minutes her intention had been to remain with him but this he would not allow he had insisted on his mother's returning to her own lodgings after a very brief interview with him no wonder he can't bear to have her about though she is his mother tiresome old thing exclaimed lydia peevishly but if algernon got rid of his mother as quickly as possible he refused to admit any one else at all and remained shut up in the dining-room whither he had had the sofa carried meaning to sleep there he had been so obliged to receive seth maxfield who came to ask when and how he would wish his wife's body conveyed from duckwell farm to whitford can't she stay there he had asked in a dazed sort of manner then added quickly turning away his head i'll leave it all to you you've been very good you've done everything for the best i am sure and he put out his hand to the farmer with his face still turned away and later on he had had to see some officials about the inquest but after that was over he locked his door and refused to open it except to polly when she brought him food he ate almost ravenously drank a great deal of wine and then lay down and dozed away the hours until dawn the next day End of chapter twenty volume three chapter twenty one of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume three chapter twenty one the inquest was to be held at the bluebell inn and after the inquest the dust of the hon castalia errington was to be laid beneath the turf of the humble village churchyard amidst less noble dust with the daisies growing impartially above all and spreading their pink-edged petals over the just and the unjust alike it was now currently reported that the thefts at the post-office had been castalia's doing mrs smith and mrs dockett had been sure of it all along so they said and so they really imagined now the story of the mysterious notes paid to revel the draper was in every mouth roger heath went about saying that mr errington ought to make his loss good out of his own pocket if he had any feelings of honour but all the people who had not lost any money in the post-office were disgusted at roger heath's hardness and avarice and asked indignantly if that was the moment to speak of such things for the tragedy of castalia's death had produced a strong effect in whitford perhaps there was not one human being in the town who grieved that she was gone but many were oppressed by the manner of her going people had an uneasy feeling in remembering how much they had disliked her almost as if their dislike had made them guilty of her death in some vague far-off inexplicable way they told themselves and each other that though her manners had been repellent poor thing yet for their part they had always felt sorry for her and had long perceived that her mind was astray and that she was falling into a low melancholy state that was likely to lead to some terrible catastrophe by this time scarcely any one in whitford entertained a doubt as to castalia's having destroyed herself and the social verdict temporary insanity was pronounced in assured anticipation that the legal verdict would be to that effect also there were two men who did not mystify themselves by conjuring up any factitious tenderness about castalia's memory and who gave way to no superstitious uneasiness of conscience as to their dislike of her when she was alive one of these men was jonathan maxfield the other was the dead woman's husband maxfield had no retrospective softness on the subject he indeed being accustomed to take certain passages of the old testament very seriously and literally and having fed his mind almost exclusively upon those passages was of opinion that castalia's tragic fate had been brought about by a direct interposition of providence as a judgment on her for her bad behaviour to himself and his daughter and if this opinion on maxfield's part should appear incredibly monstrous 
let it be remembered that in his own mind the godly were typified by the maxfield family and the ungodly by the enemies of that family as to algernon harassed anxious and doubtful of the future as he might be he was glad that his wife was dead and he knew that he was glad her death made a way out apparently the only possible way out of a labyrinth of troubles and relieved algernon from the apprehension of an exposure which it made him sick to think of he had not meant to kill her he said to himself he had certainly laid no deliberate plan to do so had he in truth been the cause of her death in the state of mind she was in would she not have thrown herself into the river or otherwise put an end to herself without that touch from him which he had given he knew not how it all seemed unreal to him when he thought of it the leaden water the grey sky and meadows and the slippery bank with its tufts of blackberry bushes he went over and over again in his mind the words that had passed between himself and castalia her violence and her wild jealousy and suspicions and her allusion to her uncle's letter and to what gibbs had told her and then her fierce threat that she would not spare him she had become utterly unmanageable mad in fact she had resolved to die she had a suicidal mania that scrap of writing would suffice to prove it to be sure he had found it and put it in his pocket-book weeks ago although he told the servant that he had picked it up off the floor that morning of his return from london but that only indicated that the idea had long been rooted in her mind and besides the paper bore no date there was nothing to show how long it had been written no it was not he who had killed castalia she had gone down willingly to death she had uttered no sound no cry he should have heard a cry all across the silent meadows he had not looked back he had fled away from the river at his topmost speed after he saw her slip and stagger and fall heavily into the black water under the shadow of the bank had she risen again to the surface it was said that drowning persons always rose three times but she had made no sound surely she would have cried out if she had longed for life ah oh, it was horrible to imagine her white face and staring eyes rising above the strong dragging current and looking for help that was all very ghastly very hideous he would not think of it it was over castalia was dead and although he would have given much that she should have died in any other way yet he was glad that she was dead and he knew that he was glad he made no pretence to himself of a factitious tenderness about her she had been thoroughly antagonistic and distasteful to him of late she had been the bitter drop flavouring every action every hope every minute of his life he had been the victim of a hard fate and of the false promises implied if not expressed of lord seely those paltry sums those notes that he had taken he had been driven into committing that action altogether by stress of circumstances it was strange to himself to think of the light that action would appear in to other people to his own mind knowing how it had come to pass in an instant by the tug of a sudden impulse it seemed so clear that there was no real ground for blaming him in the matter he had felt the difficulty of getting money with a severity which the rest of the world probably could not conceive he was absolutely indifferent to the question of abstract right or wrong justice or injustice in the case but the concrete hardship to himself of being poor he had keenly felt to be undeserved and now if it were not for one thing he should begin to breathe more freely the one thing that weighed on him with a gloomy though formless foreboding was the inquest he had been obliged to go to duckwell farm he had been asked to look at castalia's dead body he had not dared to refuse to do so but he had requested to be shown into the room where she lay alone and without witnesses the room was that sunny parlour where rhoda maxfield had sat on many a summer evening and where the neighbours had discussed the news of his own marriage less than a year ago but algernon's imagination did not wander very far from the present he walked to the window and looked out through the black trellis-work of leafless vine branches then he stared at the prints on the walls and the gay china vases filled with winter nosegays of trembling grass and chrysanthemums and then his eyes which had wandered in every other direction were compelled to turn towards the broad old-fashioned sofa covered with fair white linen under which the outlines of a human shape revealed themselves was that stiff white silent thing castalia he could not realize it he would scarcely have started if the door had opened and his wife had walked into the room in her ordinary dress and with her ordinary gait he had seen her last full of passionate excitement that stiff white silent thing could not be she he would not lift the coverlet though nor look on that which lay beneath but he stood and gazed at it until the heap beneath the linen sheet seemed to stir and change its outlines 
then he turned away shuddering to the window and looked at his watch to see whether he might venture to leave the room yet would the people think he had been there too short a time he came out at length looking pale and depressed enough to excite a good deal of sympathy in the breast of mrs seth maxfield and with his usual quick susceptibility to the impression he produced on others he was fully aware of this and gratified by it despite the chill vision of the still white heap under the coverlet which persistently haunted his memory he saw looks of pity he heard whispered exclamations of admiration and they did more than gratify they reassured him it had entered into nobody's mind to conceive that he had been the cause of his wife's death into whose head indeed should it enter or how he remembered the last lightning quick glance he had cast over the wide meadows and how it had shown them to him empty and bare of any living thing for as far as his eye could reach no he was safe from suspicion of course he was safe from suspicion and yet he would have given a year of his life to have the inquest over and the dead woman safely put away beneath the daisies in duckwell churchyard meanwhile the mortal frame that had so throbbed and suffered for his sake lay there lonely and neglected strangers hands had composed it decently a stranger's roof sheltered it it was to lie in a stranger's grave only one woman came and stood beside the couch in the sunny parlour and looked on the dead shape with eyes full of compassionate tears and before going away laid some sprays of fern and delicate hothouse blossoms on the quiet breast and fastened there a curl of light hair the hair had been cut jestingly from algernon errington's head when he was a schoolboy and then put away and forgotten for years it now lay above his dead wife's heart she was so fond of him poor soul said the compassionate woman it was minnie bodkin End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume three chapter twenty two the big room at the blue bell was full it was a room associated in the minds of most of the people present with occasions of festivity or entertainment the archery club balls were held in it it was used for the exhibitions of any travelling conjurer lecturer or musician whose evil fate brought him to whitford once a strolling company of players had performed there before some fifteen persons and several dozen cane-bottomed chairs there were the tarnished candelabra stuck in the walls the little gallery up aloft where the fiddlers sat on ball nights and the big looking-glass at one end of the room muffled with yellow muslin and surmounted by a dusty garland of paper flowers now the wintry daylight coming through the uncurtained windows made all these things look chill ghastly and forlorn people who had thought the bluebell assembly room a cheerful place enough under the bright illumination of wax candles now shivered and whispered to each other how dreary it was the coroner's jury had been out to duckwell farm to view the body and to look at the exact spot on the bank where it had been landed from the boat and to stare at the willow stump to which it had been found fastened by the clothes and they had returned to the bluebell inn to complete the inquiry into the causes of the death of castalia errington a great many witnesses had already been examined their testimony went to show that the deceased lady's behaviour of late had been very strange capricious and unreasonable almost every one of the witnesses including the servants at ivy lodge confessed that they had heard rumours of young mrs errington being not right in her mind they had observed an increasing depression of spirits in her of late obadiah gibbs's evidence was the strongest of all and his revelations created a great sensation he described his last interview with castalia at the post-office and left the impression on all his hearers which was honestly his own namely that on castalia and on her alone rested the onus of the irregularities and robberies of money letters at whitford he did his best to spare her memory he sincerely thought her irresponsible for her actions but the facts as he saw and represented them admitted of but one conclusion being come to algernon errington's appearance in the room elicited a low murmur of sympathy from the spectators his manner of giving his evidence was perfect and nothing could have been better in keeping with the circumstances of his painful position than the subdued yet quiet tones of his voice and the white strained look of his face which revealed rather the effect of a great shock to the nerves than a deep wound to the heart of course he could not be expected to grieve as a husband would grieve who has lost a dearly loved and loving wife but their having been on somewhat bad terms and castalia's notorious jealousy and bad temper made the manner of her death all the more terrible poor young man he was dreadfully cut up one could see that but he made no pretences put on no affectations of woe 
he was so simple and quiet in a word he was credited with feeling precisely what he ought to have felt his statement added scarcely any new fact to those already known he had not seen his wife alive since he parted from her when he started for london to visit lord seely who was ill he corroborated his servant's testimony to the facts that castalia had wandered out on to whit meadow about nine o'clock in the morning that he had been made uneasy by her strange absence and that he had gone himself to seek her but without success in reply to some questions by a juryman as to whether he had gone to london solely because of lord seely's illness he answered with a look of quiet sadness that that had not been his sole reason there were private matters to be spoken of between himself and his wife's uncle matters which admitted of no delay could he not have written them no he did not feel at liberty to write them they concerned his wife he had mentioned to lord seely his fears that her mind was giving way as lord seely would be able to affirm a letter found in the pocket of the deceased woman's gown was produced and read it had become partly illegible from immersion in the water but the greater portion of it could be made out it was from lord seely and referred to a painful conversation that he had had with his niece's husband about herself it was a kind letter but written evidently in much agitation and pain of mind the writer exhorted and even implored his niece to confide fully in him for her own sake as well as that of her family and promised that he would help and support her under all circumstances if she would but tell him the truth unreservedly nothing could have been better for algernon's case than that letter instead of being the cause of his disgrace and exposure it was obviously the means of confirming every one of his statements implied as well as expressed it showed clearly enough first that algernon had given lord seely to understand that his wife laboured under grave suspicions of having stolen money letters from the whitford post office secondly that he algernon believed those suspicions to be well founded thirdly that symptoms of mental aberration which had recently manifested themselves in castalia were at once the explanation of and the excuse for her conduct this letter which if castalia were alive to speak for herself would have been like a brand on her husband's forehead for life was now a most valuable testimony in his favour algernon's hard and unrelenting mood towards his dead wife grew still harder and more unrelenting as he listened to this letter and remembered that castalia had threatened him with exposure and had resolved not to spare him nothing in the world but her death could have saved him from ruin even supposing that she could have been cajoled into promising to comply with his directions she would not have been able to do so she was so stupidly literal in her statements a direct lie would have embarrassed her and then at the first jealous fit which might have seized her he would have been at her mercy lord seely's letter showed a strong feeling of irritation almost of hostility against algernon it might not be recognizable by the audience at the inquest but algernon recognized it completely and felt a distinct sense of triumph in the impotence of lord seely to harm him or to wriggle away from under his heel algernon was master of the position he appeared before the world in the light of a victim to his alliance with the seelys there could be no further talk on their part of condescension or honour conferred he and his mother had lived their lives as persons of gentle blood and unblemished reputation until the honourable castalia kilfinane brought disgrace and misery into their home in making these reflections algernon was not of course considering the inward truth of facts but their outward semblances it made no difference to his indignation against the pompous little ass who had treated him with hauteur nor to his satisfaction in humbling the pompous little ass that if all the secret circumstances hidden and silenced for ever under the cold white shroud that covered his dead wife could be revealed before the eyes of all men lord seely would have the right to detest and despise him lord seely had not treated him as he ought he was firmly persuaded of that and as he measured lord seely's duty towards him accurately by the extent of all he desired and expected of lord seely it will be seen how far short the latter had fallen of algernon's standard the seth maxfields gave their testimony as to how the deceased body had been carried into their house how they had tried all means to revive her and how every effort had been in vain and she had never moved nor breathed again the two men who had rescued the body from the water and the carpenter who had brought the news to ivy lodge repeated their story and corroborated all that the maxfields had said there only remained to be heard the important testimony of david powell he had been so ill that it was feared at one time that the inquest must be adjourned until he should be able to give his evidence but he declared that he would come and speak before the jury that he should be strengthened to do so when the moment arrived and had opposed a fixed silence to all the representations and remonstrances of the doctor on the morning of the inquest he arose and dressed himself before mrs thimbleby was up 
albeit she was no sluggard in the morning he had gone out while it was still dark into the raw foggy atmosphere of whitmeadow and had wandered there for a long time on returning to the widow thimbleby's house he had seated himself opposite to the blazing fire in the kitchen staring at it and muttering to himself like a man in a feverish dream nevertheless when the due time arrived he entered the room at the blue bell to give his evidence with a quiet steady gait his appearance there produced a profound impression a stranger contrast than he presented to the whitford burghers by whom he was surrounded could scarcely be imagined not only were his bodily shape and colouring different from theirs but the expression of his face was almost unearthly there was some subtle contradiction between the expression of david powell's sorrow-laden eyes and brow and that of the mouth with its tightly closed lips drawn back at the corners with what on ordinary faces would have been a smile but on his face being coupled with a singular pinched look of the nostrils and a strained tightness of the upper lip it became something which troubled the beholder with a sense of inexplicable pain almost terror as he advanced along the room there was a hush of attentive expectation during which dr evans the coroner curiously examined the methodist preacher with grave professional eyes after a few preliminary questions to which powell gave brief clear answers he said i have been brought hither to testify in this matter i am an instrument in the hands of the great and terrible god he works not as men work in his hand all tools are alike what can you tell us of the death of this unfortunate lady mr powell asked the coroner quietly you were the first to see her struggling in the water were you not and you made a gallant effort to save her she struggled but little she went to her death as a lamb to the slaughter nay as a victim who desires to die powell spoke in a low but distinct voice broken and harsh indeed compared with what it once was but still with a soft tremulous note in it now and then that seemed to stir deep fibres of feeling in the hearts of those who heard him in such a tone it was that he uttered the words as a victim who desires to die and tears sprang into the eyes of many from sheer emotional sympathy with the sound of his voice you are of opinion then mr powell said the coroner that the deceased wilfully put an end to her own life no you think that she was not in a state of mind to be responsible for her actions she was murdered said powell in a distinct grating tone which was audible in every corner of the crowded room End of chapter twenty two volume three chapter twenty three of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume three chapter twenty three there was a momentary rustling as if every person present had moved slightly and then a deep hush the silence seemed to last a long time but in fact only a second or two elapsed before powell drawing up his tall lean figure to its utmost height and pointing with outstretched hand full at algernon exclaimed with a kind of cry there is her murderer woe to the cruel woe to the unrighteous man ye have ploughed wickedness ye have reaped iniquity ye have eaten the fruit of lies there arose a murmur a movement a confused sound of ejaculations algernon stood up and some one laid a hand on his shoulder and pushed him back into his seat ask what he means said algernon but his voice was so weak and faint that the words were not heard beyond the few persons who immediately surrounded him he could scarcely grow paler than he had been from the beginning of the inquest but a ghastly ashen grey hue showed itself round his mouth his lips were quite colourless terror agonising terror was in his heart what did this preacher know what had he seen had castalia spoken and accused him before her death anguish for anguish perhaps he suffered at that moment as much as his victim had suffered when she felt the hand she loved send her to her death the movement and the murmur in the crowd were over in an instant the coroner sternly commanded order there was silence again and the very air seemed charged with a horrible apprehension which weighed upon every one as a coming thunderstorm oppresses the cowering birds you must speak clearly and plainly mr powell said the coroner in a severe tone state what grounds you have for this very extraordinary accusation the evidence laid before us to-day goes to show that mr errington did not see his wife since parting from her on the monday night to go to london until he was called on to identify her dead body at duckwell farm he spoke with her in the meadow by the river's brink she appealed to him she implored him she knelt to him 
I saw her gestures. Then he hurled her down the steep bank into the water, and fled away, leaving her to perish. A most profound sensation was caused by these words throughout the whole assembly. The jury looked at each other like men suddenly aroused from sleep. They seemed not only startled, but scared. Indeed, a singular expression of disquietude appeared on every face, almost as if each individual in the crowd had felt himself accused. Before any further questions could be put to Powell, there was a stir and a commotion at the lower end of the room, and a murmur of voices. Algernon Errington had swooned dead away. He must have fallen to the ground had he not been caught in the arms of his next neighbor, who happened to be Mr. Ravel, the draper. Someone in the crowd handed a smelling bottle to be held under his nose, and they cleared a little space around him to give him air by the directions of Mr. Smith, the surgeon, who was at hand. It was proposed to carry him away out of the heat and the throng. But in less than a couple of minutes he revived, and immediately on recovering consciousness, he desired to remain where he was. The terror of listening to what Powell said was not so appalling to his imagination as the terror of fancying what he might be saying when he, Algernon, should not be there to hear it. Order being restored, the preacher's examination was continued. On being asked where he had been when the circumstances alleged to have taken place happened, he replied that he had been at some distance up the river, in the midst of a thick coppice which grew low down on the bank there. He had been near enough to see, although not to hear, the interview between young Errington and his wife, and to the questions what had brought him to that remote spot at such an hour, and why he did not make his presence known at once on seeing the deceased lady fall into the water, he answered, waving his hands to and fro, "'I was prostrate on the earth, not praying, I may not pray, but suffering under the wrath of the powers of the air.' The voices were very terrible on that day. They had aroused me from my bed. They had hunted me forth in the early morning. I had wandered for a long time, for hours, after your reckoning, but for years according to the time of the spirits. Mr. Powell, said Dr. Evans sternly, this will not do. You must speak less wildly. Remember what a tremendous responsibility rests on you after making such an allegation as you have made. Answer the questions put to you clearly and seriously. But it was in vain that David Powell was catechized and cross-examined in the endeavour to draw from him any more definite account of the events of that last morning of Castalia's life. He reiterated, indeed, his statement that Algernon had willfully and forcibly thrust his wife down the bank into the river, and had then fled away at his utmost speed, and he added that he, Powell, had not thought of pursuing or calling to the murderer, being absorbed in his attempts to rescue the drowning woman. He persisted, too, in declaring that Castalia had been willing, nay, wishful, to die. She had not struggled. She had not cried out. She had not tried to reach his outstretched hand. She had closed her eyes, and had given herself up to the power of the death-cold waters. So far he was coherent and consistent. But when he endeavoured to describe how or why he had found himself on that spot at that hour, he wandered off into the wildest statements, and grew ever more and more excited. His face flushed, his eyes blazed, his voice rose almost to a scream. He broke into a torrent of words, standing up in the face of the crowd, and emphasising his discourse with strange, violent gestures. "'I will declare the truth!' he exclaimed. "'I will cry aloud and spare not!' now therefore be content look upon me for it is evident unto you if i lie then with a sudden change of tone sinking his voice to a hoarse hollow monotone and gazing straight before him with wide horror-stricken eyes he added let me speak let me confess the truth before i go whence i shall not return even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death a land of darkness as darkness itself and of the shadow of death without any order, and where the light is as darkness. A shudder ran through the audience. The preacher seemed to hold them in a spell. No voice was raised to interrupt him. Many persons turned pale as they listened. But on one face in the crowd the color faintly dawned again. In one breast the preacher's voice, giving utterance to the awful and glowing imagery of the Hebrew of old time, awoke something like a sensation of relief and comfort. Algernon Errington felt the life blood pulsing warmly again in his veins. This Methodist man was mad, clearly mad. What was his testimony worth? Powell went on, speaking still more brokenly and incoherently. I am a castaway, he said. I declare it before you all. Some of you have listened to my ministrations in other days. I spoke then of assurance, of Christian perfection. Those words were in vain. 
there are but the elect and the reprobate and unto the number of those latter i am doomed i have long known it and struggled against the knowledge but i declare it to ye now as a testimony how shall a man be just with god this is one thing therefore i said it he destroyeth the perfect and the wicked the coroner recovered his presence of mind in truth he had been so absorbed in studying david powell with the professional interest of a doctor and a psychologist that he had suffered him to ramble on thus far unchecked but now he broke in upon him abruptly we cannot listen to this sort of thing mr powell he said all this has no bearing on the present inquiry then he said a few words as to the desirability of an adjournment mr errington might wish to call some other witnesses powell had acknowledged that he had been too far distant to hear a word of the conversation he alleged to have taken place between the husband and wife it was possible therefore that he had been too distant to see the two persons with sufficient distinctness to swear to their identity some more particular testimony might be obtained as to the precise hour at which the deceased lady had been last seen alive and as to what her husband had been doing at that time upon this algernon errington arose in his place and said in a clear though slightly tremulous voice for myself i desire no adjournment but i should like to put a few questions to this witness there was a sudden hush of profound attention david powell still stood up in the face of the assembly he was rocking himself to and fro in a singular restless way and muttering under his breath very rapidly it was observable too that his hands seemed continually attracted to one point in the room just behind algernon errington every now and then he passed his hands over his eyes as if to obliterate or shut out some painful sight but he did not turn his head away and in the next instant after making that gesture he would stare at the same point again with an expression of intense horror algernon waited for an instant before speaking then he said in such a tone as one uses to attract the attention of a very young child mr powell will you try to listen to me the preacher immediately looked full at him but without replying algernon did not meet his eye but turned his face aside towards the coroner and the jury he looked at them with an appealing glance and a slight movement of his head in the direction of powell then he resumed the accusation you have brought against me is so overwhelming so amazing that it is not very wonderful if i feel almost stunned and dizzy how such a notion ever entered your brain heaven only knows i deny it completely unequivocally solemnly to me it seems that such a denial must be unnecessary the thing is so monstrous but will you try to answer one or two questions with some calmness how long had you been in the copse before you saw my wife walking by the riverside powell shook his head restlessly and passed his hand over his forehead with the action of brushing something off i, I was called out before the dawn he said the voices bade me go forth they sounded like brazen bells in the silence beating and quivering here and he pressed his fingers on his temples you hear voices which are unheard by other people then often every day every hour tell me do you not sometimes see forms that other persons cannot see powell started trembled violently and looked at algernon with an expression of bewildered terror but it was at the same time manifest that some gleam of reason was struggling against the delusions in his mind he felt and perceived dimly as one perceives external circumstances through sleep that a trap was being laid for him the pathetic questioning look in his eyes as he vainly tried to recover the government of his mind was intensely painful for a second or two he remained silent with parted lips and clenched hands like a man making a violent and supreme effort it seemed as if in another instant he might succeed in gaining sufficient mastery over himself to reply collectedly but algernon did not give time for such a chance to happen he repeated his question more eagerly and loudly looking at the preacher almost threateningly as he spoke tell me mr powell and remember what a responsibility you have assumed before god and man in making this accusation tell me truly whether you do not see visions figures of men and women that other people cannot see don't forms appear before your eyes and vanish again as suddenly have you not told your landlady mrs thimbleby as much on many occasions how can you dare to assert with confidence that from the distance you say you are at you could distinguish my face and that of my wife all your descriptions of her violent gestures and kneeling on the ground and clasping her hands does not that seem more like the delusions of fancy than the information of your sober senses algernon spoke with indignant heat and rapidity a calculated heat a purposed rapidity meant to have a confusing effect on the preacher and which had that effect 
but which also excited a sympathetic indignation in many of the auditors powell looked wildly around him and clasped his hands above his head you must put one question at a time mr errington said dr evans then i put this question david powell do you or do you not see visions and faces and figures that the rest of the world is as unconscious of as of the voices that called you out to whitmeadow that morning that my poor wife was drowned powell with his eyes still fixed on the same point that he had been gazing on so long suddenly cried out with a loud voice as god liveth who hath taken away my judgment and the almighty who hath vexed my soul my lips shall not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit god forbid that i should justify you till i die i will not remove my integrity from me it is there there behind his shoulder it has been holding me with the power of its eyes oh how dreadful are those eyes and that ashen grey face look behold the lord has brought a witness from the grave to testify to the truth see behold can you not see her look where she stands in her cold wet garments with the water dripping from her hair she points at him o oh, god most terrible the drowned woman points her cold finger at her murderer he stretched out his arms toward algernon and then with one bound leaped shrieking into the midst of the crowd a dozen hands were put forth to hold him he struggled with the tremendous strength of insanity but was at length forcibly carried out of the room a raving maniac after that there were not many words of an official nature spoken in the room the inquest was adjourned to the following day and the assembly dispersed to carry the account of the strange scene that had happened all over whitford and its neighbourhood End of chapter 23volume three chapter twenty four of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume three chapter twenty four the next day medical evidence was forthcoming as to the insanity of david powell who had been removed to the county asylum testimony was moreover given by many persons showing that the preacher's mind had long been disordered even the widow thimbleby's evidence given with many tears went to prove that but she tried with all her might to bear witness to his goodness and clung loyally to her loving admiration for his character he may not be quite in his right senses for matters of this world sobbed the poor woman and he has been sorely tormented by taking up with these doctrines of election but if ever there was an angel sent down to suffer on this earth and help the sorrowful and call sinners to repentance mr powell is that angel i know what he is and i have had other lodgers good kind gentlemen too i don't say to the contrary but overboil their eggs in the morning or leave a lump in their feather bed and you'd soon get a glimpse of the old adam now with mr powell nothing put him out except sin and even that did but make him the more eager to save your soul several witnesses who had testified on the previous day were re-examined and some new ones were found who swore to having met mr errington going along the road from his own house towards whitford in great agitation and asking every one he met if they had seen his wife the hour was such that to the best of their belief it was impossible he should have had such an interview as powell described with the deceased between the time at which the cook swore he left his own house and their meeting him in the road on this point however the evidence was somewhat conflicting but the whitford clocks were well known to be conflicting also st mary's being always foremost with its jangling bell the town hall clock coming next except occasionally when it hastened to be first with apparently quite capricious zeal and the mellow chimes of st chad's that were heard far over town and meadow closing the chorus with their sweet cadence there certainly appeared to be no cause no conceivable motive for algernon errington to have committed the crime many witnesses combined to show with what sweetness and good humour he bore his wife's jealous tempers and besides it was notorious that he had hoped through her influence to obtain assistance and promotion from her uncle lord seeley whereas on the other hand there did seem to be several motives at work to induce the unfortunate lady to put an end to her own existence there could be little doubt that she had committed the post-office robberies and the fear of detection had weighed on her mind moreover that she had for some time past been made unhappy by jealousy and discontent and had contemplated making away with herself was proved by several scraps of writing besides that which her husband had found and produced at the inquest the first day 
in brief no one was surprised when the foreman of the coroner's jury delivered a verdict to the effect that the deceased lady had committed suicide while under the influence of temporary insanity and added a few words stating the opinion of the jury that mr algernon errington's character was quite unstained by the accusation of a maniac who had been proved to have been subject to insane delusions for some time past it was just the sort of verdict that every one had expected and the general sympathy with algernon still ran high as for him he got away from the blue bell as quickly as possible after the inquest was over slipping away by a back door where a closed fly was waiting for him when he reached his home he locked himself into the dining-room and sat down on the sofa with closed eyes and his body leaning listlessly against the cushions as if all vital force were gone from him the prevailing and for a time the only sensation he felt was one of utter weariness he was so completely exhausted that the restful attitude the silence and the solitude seemed positive luxuries he was scarcely conscious of his escape he felt merely that the strain was over and that voice face and limbs might sink back from the terrible tension he had held them in to a natural lassitude but by and by he began to realize the danger he had passed and to exult in his new sense of freedom castalia being removed it seemed as if all troubles must be removed with her the funeral of mrs algernon errington was to take place on the following day and it was known that lord seeley would be present at it if it were possible for him to make the journey from london it was said that he had been very ill but was now better and would use his utmost endeavours to pay that mark of respect to his niece's memory mrs errington indeed talked of my lord's coming as proof of his sympathy with her boy but the world knew better than that it knew by some mysterious means that lord seeley had quarrelled with algernon and when his lordship did appear in whitford and took up his quarters at the blue bell rumours went about to the effect that he had refused to see young errington and had remained shut up in his own room attended by his physician this however was not true lord seeley had seen algernon and spoken with him but he had not touched his proffered hand he had said no word to him of sympathy he had barely looked at him the poor old man was overpowered by grief for castalia and it was in vain for algernon to put on a show of grief about a matter of fact lord seeley would even now have found it difficult to think that algernon was telling him a point-blank lie but on a matter of feeling it was different algernon's words and voice rang false and hollow and the old man shrank from him lord seeley had come down to whitford on getting the news of castalia's terrible death without knowing any particulars about it those were not the days when the telegraph brought a budget of intelligence from the most distant parts of the earth every morning a few hurried and confused lines were all that lord seeley had received but they were sufficient to make him insist on performing the journey to whitford at once lady seeley had tried to impress on him the necessity of shaking off young errington now that castalia was gone wash your hands of him valentine my lady had said if poor cassy has done this desperate deed it's he that drove her to it smooth-faced young villain to all this lord seeley had made no reply but in his own mind he had almost resolved to help algernon to a place abroad it was what his poor niece would have desired but then after his arrival in whitford all the painful details of the coroner's inquest were made known to him he made inquiries in all directions and learned a great deal about his niece's life in the little town the prominent feelings in his mind were pity and remorse pity for castalia's unhappy fate and acute remorse for having been so weak as to let her marriage take place without any attempt to interfere despite his own secret conviction that it was an ill-assorted and ill-omened one you couldn't have helped it my lord said the friendly physician to whom he poured out some of the feelings that oppressed his heart perhaps not perhaps not but i ought to have tried my poor dear unhappy girl on the day of the funeral lord seeley stood side by side with algernon at castalia's grave in duckwell churchyard but when it was over they parted and drove back to whitford in separate carriages lord seeley was to return to london early the next morning but before he went away he determined to pay a visit to the county lunatic asylum and see david powell on the day of the funeral algernon had spoken a few words to lord seeley about his wish to get away from the painful associations which must henceforward haunt him in whitford and had reminded his lordship of the promise made in london but lord seeley had made no definite answer and moreover he had said that by his doctor's advice he must decline a visit which algernon offered to make to him that evening was the pompous little ass going to throw him over after all in the course of that afternoon he heard that old maxfield intended to come down on him pitilessly for the full amount of the bills he held a reaction had set in in public sentiment 
tradesmen who could not get paid and whose hopes of eventual payment were greatly damped by the coolness of lord seely's behaviour to his nephew-in-law began to feel their indignation once more override their compassion the two servants at ivy lodge asked for their wages and declared that they did not wish to remain there another week algernon's position at the post-office was forfeited he knew that he could not keep it even if he would it began to appear that the removal of castalia had not after all removed all troubles from her husband's path but the heaviest blow of all was to come lord seely left whitford without seeing him again and sent back unopened a note which algernon had written begging for an interview with these words written outside the cover in a trembling hand dare not to write to me or importune me more algernon received this late at night and before noon the next day the fact was known all over whitford people began to say that lord seely had obtained access to david powell had spoken with him and had gone away convinced of the substantial truth of his testimony that his lordship had left orders that powell should lack no comfort or attention which his unhappy state permitted of his enjoying and that he had strongly expressed his grateful sense of the poor preacher's efforts to save his niece from london lord seely who had heard that miss bodkin had visited duckwell farm while his niece lay dead there and had placed flowers on her unconscious breast sent a morning ring and a letter the contents of which minnie communicated to no one but her parents nevertheless its contents were discussed pretty widely and were said to be of a nature very damnatory to algernon errington's character however the painful things that were said in whitford could not hurt him for he had gone disappeared in the night like a thief as his creditors said and no one could say whither End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five conclusion our tale is almost told the last words that need saying can be briefly said when some weeks had passed away mrs errington received a letter from her son demanding a remittance to be sent forthwith post restant to a little seaport town on the italian riviera he had not during the interval left his mother in absolute ignorance as to what had become of him but had sent her a few brief lines from london saying that he had been obliged to leave whitford in order to escape being put in prison for debt that his present intention was to go abroad and that she should hear again from him before long algernon had been so quick in his movements that he managed to be in town before the story of lord seely's having cast him off had had time to be circulated amongst his acquaintances there and he was enabled as a result of his activity to obtain from miss matchin stubbs and others several letters of introduction calculated to be of use to him abroad he was described by mrs matchin stubbs as a nephew of lord seely and her intimate friend who was travelling on the continent to recruit his health after the shock of his wife's sudden death he had brought away from whitford such few jewels belonging to his dead wife as were of any value and he sold them in london he furnished himself handsomely with such articles as were desirable for a gentleman of fortune travelling for his pleasure and allowed the west end tradesman to whom the hon john patrick price had recommended him during his brilliant london season to write down against him in their books some very extortionate charges for the same his outfit being accomplished in this inexpensive manner he was enabled to travel with as much comfort as was compatible in those days with a journey from london to calais and he stepped on to the french shore with a considerable sum of money in his pocket for a long time the tidings of him that reached whitford were uncertain and conflicting then they began to arrive at even wider and wider intervals and finally after mrs errington left the town they ceased altogether to reach the general world of whitfordians the real history of the circumstances which induced mrs errington to leave the home of so many years was known to very few persons it was this about a twelvemonth after algernon's departure mrs errington made a sudden journey to london and on her return she confided to her old friend dr bodkin that she had sold out of the funds nearly the whole sum from which her little income was derived and transmitted it to algy who had an absolute need for the money which she considered paramount but my dear soul you have ruined yourself cried the doctor aghast algernon will repay me sir replied the poor old woman drawing herself up with the ghost of her old aunt from grandeur the upshot was that dr bodkin in concert with one or two other old friends of her late husband made some representations on her behalf to mr philthorpe the wealthy bristol merchant who was as the reader may remember a cousin of dr errington and that mr philthorpe benevolently allowed his cousin's widow a small annuity which together with the few pounds that still remained to her of her own enabled her to live in decent comfort but she professed herself unable to remain in whitford and removed to a cottage in dorrington 
where she had a kind friend in the wife of the headmaster of the proprietary school whom we first presented to the reader as little rhoda maxfield mrs diamond as she was now lived in a very handsome house and wore very elegant dresses and was looked upon as a personage of some importance in dorrington and its vicinity her husband had decidedly opposed a proposition she made to him to receive mrs errington as an inmate of his home but he put no further constraint on rhoda's affectionate solicitude about her old friend and the two women drove together and sewed together and talked together and their talk was chiefly about that exiled victim of unmerited misfortune algernon errington rhoda preserved her faith in the ancrum glories and although she acknowledged to herself that algernon had treated her badly he was invested in her mind with some mysterious immunity from the obligations that bind ordinary mortals a visitor who was often cordially welcomed at dorrington by matthew diamond was miss chubb and the kind-hearted little spinster endured a vast amount of snubbing and patronage from her old enemy on the battleground of polite society mrs errington with much charitable sweetness old max lived to see his daughter's first-born child but he was unable to move from his bed for many months before his death perhaps it was the period of quiet reflection thus obtained when the things of this world were melting away from his grasp which occasioned the addition of a codicil to the old man's will that surprised most of his acquaintance he had settled the bulk of his property on his daughter at her marriage and in his original testament had bequeathed the whole of the residue to her also but the codicil set forth that his only and beloved daughter being amply provided for and his son james inheriting the stock fixtures and good will of his flourishing business together with the house and furniture jonathan maxfield felt that he was doing injustice to no one by bequeathing the sum of three thousand pounds to miss minnie bodkin as a mark of respect and admiration and he moreover left one hundred pounds free of duty to that god-fearing member of the wesleyan society richard gibbs now living as groom in the service of orlando pawkins esq of pudcombe hill a bequest which sensibly embittered the flavour of the sermon preached by the unlegacied brother jackson on the next sunday after old max's funeral dr bodkin still lives and rules in whitford grammar school his wife's life is brightened by the sight of her minnie's increased health and strength but she has never quite forgiven matthew diamond and has been heard to say that young mr diamond's children are the most singularly uninteresting she ever saw of minnie herself the chronicle hitherto records a life of useful benevolence undisfigured by ascetic affectation or the assumption of any pious livery whatever she keeps her old delight in all the beautiful things of art and nature and old max's legacy has enabled her to enjoy some foreign travel she is still in the first prime of womanhood and more beautiful than ever but at the last accounts poor mr warlock has not been tortured by the spectacle of any successful rival for his part he goes on worshipping miss bodkin with hopeless fidelity for a long time minnie continued to visit david powell in the lunatic asylum at stated periods he generally recognized her and the sight of her seemed to soothe and comfort him after a while he was pronounced cured and left the asylum but his madness returned on him at intervals and he would voluntarily go and place himself under restraint when he felt the black fit coming he did not live very long being assailed by a mortal consumption but as his body wasted his mind grew clearer stronger and more serene and before his death minnie had the satisfaction to hear him profess a humble faith in the divine goodness and a fearless confidence in the mysterious hand that was leading him even as a little child into the shadowy land there was as large a concourse of people at his burial as had ever thronged to hear his fiery preaching on whitmeadow his memory became surrounded by a saintly radiance in the imaginations of the poor stories of his goodness and his afflictions and the final ray of peace which god sent to cheer his last moments were long retailed amongst the whitford methodists and his grave is still bright with carefully tended flowers of algernon errington the strangest rumours were circulated for a time some said that he had become croupier at a foreign gambling table others declared that he had married a west indian heiress with a million of money and was living in florence in unheard-of luxury others again affirmed that they had the best authority for believing that he had gone to the united states and had appeared on the stage there with immense success however the remembrance of him passed away from men's minds in whitford within a few years in london within a few months but it was a long time before jack price left off recounting his final interview with errington that young ancrum you know captivating way of his own what on my honour the rascal borrowed ten pounds of me ready money sir down on the nail bedad it was a tour de force for i never have a shilling in my pocket for my own use 
but Ancrum would coax the little birds off the bushes, as they say in my part of the world. Principal? Oh, devil a rag of principal in his whole composition. What? I wonder what the deuce has become of him. I give you my word and honour he was really, really now, a charming fellow. End of chapter 25 End of a charming fellow